Joy in the city. Joy in your life. Joy in your family. And joy everywhere in Jesus' name. GCK Authority has announced the next level move. From the land of honor and integrity comes two in one GCK live in Ekiti State, Southwest Nigeria. The Global Crusade and Retreat, December 22 to 27, 2022. A new level of Impact Academy for Youth. Young adults and professionals. Titled Recharge to Excel. December 27, 2022. At all 600 hours GMT. All broadcasts live on satellite, radio, television, and all our social media platforms. With Jonathan White, our guest music minister. GCK, the gospel to every creature. Almighty God, we thank you very much for how far you have led us in this Congress. We thank you because truly you are providing solutions to all problems in our lives, our moral lives, our spiritual lives, academic lives, physical lives. You are challenging us. And we know that, Lord, we will be what you want us to be in Jesus name we pray Lord as Jesus Christ was born in the manger who lived a perfect life who died for us on the cross of Calvary who rose on the third day who is now exalted at the right hand of the Father and is coming back again as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords we pray O Lord all the grace the riches of the kingdom through redemption available through him we pray that everything will be ours in jesus name and we pray that on that final day when he comes to set up his millennial reign we shall reign with him in jesus name and we're praying that any trait of character which will hinder us from being at a side reigning with him, fellowship with him, ruling with him in that coming kingdom. You take all those traits of characters away from us in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, that all you expect each one of us to be and to do, we will be, we will do in Jesus' name. Nothing more nothing less nothing else just what you want where you want us to be who you want us to be what you want us to do where you want us to go just what you want nothing more nothing less nothing else make us fit into your plan into your program that there will be no selfish ambition within us. There will be no pride within us. Just to be who you want us to be. Just to do what you want us to do. Just to go where you want us to go. Keep us by your grace. Bring our lives under control. As we see your good steps. Help us to follow after those good steps. And as we see the bad examples of some people, even in Bible days, help us to avoid all evil and to follow only that which is good. We know you will do it. Our lives are going to be beautiful for you. In Jesus' name, we pray. This morning we come to an important study of the scripture and as you must have noticed on your program we are studying a particular character a particular personality and of course there will be a lot of reasons in the mind of God why in his providence he has arranged and planned that we will study such a character as we are studying. And I pray that whatever it is the Lord has in mind, for you and for me, 
The Lord will not allow any of us to miss it in Jesus' name. A lot of references we will need to read. And we have such a brief period of time. But let's see what the scripture has to say. We're talking about Absalom. Talking about Absalom. If you pick up that name and you divide it into two, you're going to have Ab, Ab. And you're going to have Salom. S-A-L-O-M. Immediately, as I divide the name into two, you see that there is an Ab, and then there is a Salom, which actually is another contracted form of Shalom. And if you are very conversant with the Old Testament, you will know that whenever we say Shalom, we are talking about peace. Now the Ab may be the problem for you. And the Ab, if I can help you, is the beginning of Abraham. And then the beginning of Abraham. Now you know that Abraham means high father, the father of the heights, the Ab. And then the Abraham, the father of nations. Then as you think as a student, you know that the common denominator, the common factor in Abraham, Abraham will be the Ab. And then you see the meaning I gave you, the father of Abraham, the father of Abraham. Then if I want to analyze and I want to extract Ab out of it, what is Ab? Father, you have got it, you are good students. Now, therefore, Absalom in its original root meaning actually means the Ab, father of Shalom, peace, the father of peace. The Lord had a good intention, a good purpose, a good career, a good profession, a good privilege, a great thing awaiting that young man, Absalom, the father of peace. And the nation should have been looking up to him to bring peace into that nation and to continue the peace or to start the peace which will culminate in the other siege of David, the prince of peace. But unfortunately, something happened to him that the career changed. The intention changed. The original purpose was not fulfilled. Instead of being the father and the originator of peace, he was not a man of peace, a man of conflict. A man of killings. A man that really even tried to drive his father off the throne. That's the man we are studying today. And there is a lot we really have uh, to see in his life. In 2 Samuel chapter 3. 2 Samuel chapter 3 verses 2 and 3. And unto David were born sons in Hebron. His first born was Amnon of Ahinoam, the Jezreelite, the Jezreelites. And his second Shiliab of Abigail, wife of Nabal, the Cana, the Camelite, and the third Absalom, the son of Meaka, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. Already, as I have read those verses to you, you have the mention of Absalom, the son of Meaka, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. That brings something to you immediately. The father David was a king. The mother was the daughter of a king. That means he was of royal descent on both sides. The mother coming from a royal family and the father sitting upon the throne 
of Israel, the greatest nation, the privileged nation, the people of God. He was the favorite of his father. In fact, not just the favorite of his father, he was the idol, the eyeball, the apple of the eye of the father. And yet, as we look at Absalom, we can see that concerning God, he made him perfect in beauty. Concerning his lineage, he came from the royal line on both sides. Concerning privilege, nobody had privilege like him in the land of Israel. Concerning ability, capability, he had persuasiveness as well as eloquence that could sway the whole nation and win anyone's heart in the nation. Qualities, characteristics, grace, gift, charisma, intelligence, natural ability, and the family privilege, he had everything combined together. They all made it, they all made him a conspicuous figure in the nation. As we talk about uh, this man, I want you to see in this second Samuel chapter 14, reading from verse 1. Now, Joab, the son of Zeruiah, perceived that the king's heart was toward Absalom. Can you think of a man that had all these natural qualities, privileges we have spoken about, and then the heart of the king, the highest person in the whole nation, was towards him. Not only that, the hearts of all the people in the nation were towards him. A man that had not just privilege alone, not just ability alone, not just the capacity, the skill to do something alone. Not just profession and a career, servants to help him. And a person that had not a single enemy in a whole nation. Everybody in Israel just wanted to help him. Just looking at him, they were attracted towards him. They wanted to help him, and the father also loved him and appreciated him. He could have been the greatest figure that Israel ever knew. But there's a devil in the world. And things that look positive, if we give the devil a chance, he can turn a whole river of pure water into poisoned water without a drop of drinkable water left. And you look at your life now. Everything is made for you. Child of God. Bible in your hand. Gospel in your heart. Grace of God in your life. Holy Ghost abiding with you. The comforter. The helper. The redeemer. And if you will follow the Lord, everything literally can just be climbing up until you get to the mountain top. Yet, there's a devil in the world. And if we allow that devil... We don't uh, tell the devil, mind your business, I am going to be a child of God. If we allow the devil to come in, and there is any crack in our lives, whereby the devil will come in and turn everything upside down, the ocean of pure water may be so poisoned until there is not a drop of drinkable water in it anymore. That's why we want to really settle down and think through and read the story of this man and see what happened to him and then by the grace of God we're going to avoid that path of perdition and destruction before I go on I'm going to read two verses of scripture to you purposely in Luke chapter 9 Luke chapter 9 reading from verse 44 let these sayings sink down into your ears. This is not just preaching. This is something that is going to affect your life. This is something you are going to make a decision. And you are going to say the picture 
that heaven has drawn concerning me. I want that picture to be fulfilled. I don't want the hands of the devil. I don't want the activities of demons. I do not want any activities here on earth to change the original plan of God. The privilege I have in the Lord, I want to hold on to that privilege. I do not want to have anything that will turn everything upside down. Let these sayings sink down deep into your ears. Let it sink. You know, sometimes we hear the word of God. And the thing remains superficially in our lives. And because it remains superficially there, the birds of the air, the demons, the agents of the devil will come and pick everything away and will become as we were before we heard the message. And it doesn't sink in. It doesn't saturate us. It doesn't affect us. It's not in our veins. It doesn't get into our blood. It doesn't get into a thinking pattern. It doesn't become a part of the working tools in our lives. Because we heard it. It was on the surface. We didn't allow it to sink in. It was not embedded within us. And there was nothing to work with. And we just become ordinary. Shallow. As if we never heard that thing before. You are going to be different. Something is going to happen to you. Your heart will be open. Yeah. Every word of the Lord that drops in will see deep into the deepest part of your very nature. Yeah. That you will never be the same again. Yeah. And it is that word in you, injected into you, saturating you, that will influence you, that will move you, that will drive you, and you will be so driven by the word and the spirit of God, you will not be the same person again. Yeah. I promised you two verses. The second one is in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 7. Consider what I say. And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. You see many times we hear the word of God. And we do not consider it. We do not think it over. We do not apply it. We do not write it down. We do not examine it. We do not analyze it. We do not analyze it in such a way we make every detail applicable to our lives and then we say, yes, I see the trap of the devil there. I see the maneuvering of the devil there. I see the machinations of the devil there. I see the strategy of the devil there. I see what the devil is trying to do. He's trying to come in through that area. You consider the word of the Lord. It is in that consideration, in that thinking it over, in that application, in that analysis of the word, in measuring your, your life with the word of God and staying by the word of God before the word of God long enough that it has a permanent influence upon your life, then the Lord will give you understanding in all things. You see, there are people that just think, I don't know what happens to me. I hear the word of God many times. I read the Bible many times. But as I read, I forget. As I hear, I forget. And I do not understand what I'm hearing. Consider it. Consider what I say. It's only after that consideration, the Lord will give you understanding in all things. You are in a good place. The Lord is going to give you understanding. And this understanding that will come to your life, I'm telling you that your life can be so beautified by the grace of God that even angels will look at you and envy you. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It will happen to you. Now, you see in the case of Arsenal, what he failed to do, he had a good father, a preacher. He had a good father. If you collect all the chapters that David, his father, wrote in the Bible, in the Psalms, you will discover that maybe there is no other person except Moses that wrote equal number of chapters as David. A good father that could teach the Bible. A good father that knew the word of God. A good father that knew about faith, that knew about prayer, that knew about the grace of God. But this man in the midst of plenty. 
in the midst of abundance, in the midst of heaven on earth, in the midst of the greatest privilege any Israelite could ever have. He turned to the other side and he had an untimely death, untimely end, tragedy, graceless life, wasted life, tragic end. From the throne, he came right to the bottom of the valley. What a foolish man. Well, sometimes we have to look at foolish men so that we can avoid their foolishness. So that what happened to them will not happen to us. And I believe something good is waiting for you. We study this so that you will know as you have the privilege. Who will say you don't have privilege? You have. I said you have privilege. That as we look at all these things, you will consider it very well. You won't say, no, it cannot happen to me. I'm a special child. I'm a privileged child. Consider it. Think about it. Think it over. And make sure that you turn it over, turn it over, turn it over in your life. Only then will you be able to have the plan, the purpose, the will of God awaiting for you and it will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Let's see this uh, young man, point number one, the pride of privileged Absalom. The pride of privileged Absalom. In 2 Samuel chapter 14, 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 25, but in all Israel there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. Have you seen a man like that before? Moses was not like that. He had his own stammering blemish. And you'll find that Paul was not like that. History tells us Paul was short with a long nose. Don't say that on your campus. Because that man was a great apostle. But you see, here we are, that we have Absalom. And this Absalom was so perfect in beauty. From the sole of his foot, even to the very crown of his head, the word of God, the spirit of God, and all the Israelites, they looked at him, and none could find any blemish in him. But... That beauty now made him to feel, see how handsome I am. See all the privileges I have. And see everything is made for me. Who is like unto Absalom? And who can compare with me in this whole nation? That's the genesis, the origin, the source, the fountain of pride. Once you begin to look at what you are, who you are, what you have, all the praise unto God, you begin to look at yourself now, and you are claiming the glory for yourself, is the origin, and the fountain, and the source, and the genesis, the beginning of pride in our lives. And that pride drove him, drove him beyond speed, beyond normal ordinary speed. Look at chapter 15 from verse 1. And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses. Fifty men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the great, uh, the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, that then Absalom called unto him and said, Oh, what city of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, the matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, Oh, that I might make judge in the land that every man which has any suit or cause might come unto me. And I would do him justice. And it was so 
That when any man came near to him to do him obeisance, bend down a little as a sign of respect for the son of the king, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. You see the pride, the way the pride led him. He said, I'm not happy with what I've got. I want to get more. That's it. That's it. I'm not happy with where I am. I want to get further. That's it. I'm not happy with the little opportunity I have. I want to have more. That's it. He was not happy with where he was, what he was, what he was doing, who the Lord had made him. He wasn't willing to wait for the time of the Lord. And all the people that will come to the king, the pride in his heart, made him to stay at the gate. And he will uh, get to them by the way, before they got to the king. And he will say, of what tribe are you? They will answer him. And when they want to buy, he will pull them up. Why are you buying unto me? We are equal. And it's not humility. It's actually the backside of pride. And then he will say, you see now, your case is good. He never told anybody you are wrong. Everybody was right. It was the politics of Absalom. And he will just comment everybody. Somebody had done wrong, your case is good. Somebody has told him, you see now, your case is good. Another fellow had cheated his neighbor, you see now, your case is good. And he tried to steal their hearts away from the king. But it was because of pride. But what does pride do to us? What punishment does pride carry? In Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. In verse 5. Everyone that is proud in heart. It's an abomination to the Lord. Though hand joined in hand, he shall not be unpunished. I'm sure you understand when it says, it shall not be unpunished. Not, that's negative. On, before that word punished. That's what? That's negative. I know what I used to tell my students. Negative times negative positive. So when you have not, on, you combine them together, now you are going to have positive. So that makes me to remove the on and the not to get positive. You understand? Read it that way now. Everyone that is a proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, let's read together. He shall be punished. Uh, you know, many people don't understand the Bible. They say, he shall not be unpunished. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, it just means he shall be punished. And so you understand that when a person is proud in heart, and is proud in his life, that pride will lead him to punishment. But then he tells us, everyone, everyone means everyone. No exception. The moment you become proud in heart, no matter how beautiful you are, no matter how handsome you are, no matter how knowledgeable you are, no matter how skilled you are, no matter your profession, no matter your skill, your ability, your capability, your charisma, your gift, once you are proud in heart, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination unto the Lord. Therefore, Absalom became abomination unto the Lord. And you see, it was a beauty that corrupted him. That's exactly what happened to other people before him and after him. And that's still what is happening to many people today. In Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16. In verse 15. But thou didst trust in thine own beauty. You see that Absalom was beautiful, handsome. And now we are told of another individual. Actually, this represents the nation of Israel. But he's giving us the uh, figure metaphor of a lady. 
and this could be you as a lady thou didst trust in thy own beauty and played the harlot because of thy renown and poured out thy fornications on everyone that passed by his it was now you can see what beauty does to some people instead of knowing that this beauty this handsomeness actually came from the lord and god has a purpose in making me to be handsome or beautiful like this or having whatever privilege i have instead of giving everything to the lord then they turn that beauty into a kind of instrument for inst for immorality fornication it says he she poured out her fornications upon every man that passed by his each was that's the problem with many people once they see that they have a particular quality they turn everything around and they not they use it for the devil in ezekiel chapter 28 verse 17 thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty it happened to absalom like that his heart was lifted up he became proud uncontrollable because of the beauty and because of the characteristics he had his heart was lifted up because of his beauty and the same thing might be happening to you you look at yourself in the mirror and then you become so proud because you think you are beautiful maybe you are maybe you are not you think you are handsome maybe you are maybe it's just that you are in love with yourself and you think you are what you are not but pride comes in or you look at your brain you look at your ability and you say i never fail any exam prayer or no prayer god's help or no god's help grace of god or no grace of god campus fellowship or no campus fellowship as a student i've always been the first even before i became a christian therefore there's no problem all these people that are praying and praying and praying and fasting before they can pass exam i don't know what is wrong with them for me i have first class brain that's your problem because you see now that brain has become a source a genesis a source of pride in your life because of the beauty he became proud and thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness you see some people that are brilliant and they feel that they are brilliant everything is made for them and every time the first time they take an exam that time they pass that exam and the only choice they make to get into a particular institution they say i don't i don't uh, normally go first choice second choice i just make one choice in my life because i am such a good student and i have everything made for me why do i need a second choice is the people that cannot make it up to the cutoff point that will be looking for second choice and uh, maybe in where you are now the one you just wrote there is uh, where you are now and because of that you think anybody like me anybody as bright as brilliant like myself anybody like me that will you know go on saturday night and have all the fun all the pleasure i want to have on sunday have all the free time pleasure i want to have and start that exam on, on monday and i still come first anybody like that i'm the only one and because i'm the only one like that now i am proud and i don't know there is god here i don't know authorities anywhere i don't know leadership anywhere because i am so bright because i am on top i think i will always be there even without the help of god it says i will cast thee to the ground i will lay thee before the kings and it shall behold thee you see that's what happened to absalom it was the pride you see this thing we call beauty it drives many people in different directions please turn with me to isaiah isaiah chapter 3 verse 24 isaiah chapter 3 verse 24 and it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell there shall be stink instead of a gradual a range instead of well set air boldness 
And instead of his stomacher, a garden of sackcloth and burning instead of instead of beauty. You see these daughters of Zion. And they just felt, look at us. Look at who we are. And we are not like any other nation. You know, sometimes uh, those nations in the olden days, they made comparison. They will say, if you look at the ladies coming out of this nation, compare them with all the ladies in the surrounding nations, none like them. And you know, sometimes there are tribes of a nation that also brag like that. Uh, they say, well, if you look at ladies coming from this tribe, you just know that they are masterpieces um, that came out of the hand of a god of beauty. You look at them and you will know that they are not from this other uh, state. They are not from this other tribe. They are not from this other province. They are coming from a particular tribe that is known for beauty. That's how they felt. These people felt they were so beautiful. And then they added a lot of other things to make themselves more beautiful until it became nauseating in the eyes in the nostrils of the almighty God. Look at what they did. In Isaiah chapter 3 verse 16. Moreover, the Lord says, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, proud, pompous, selfish, and self-centered, it says, and the walk was stretched forth next, they even practice how to walk in a special way and then they look out look to the right look to the left and look back and look at you in the corner of their eyes whether everybody is appreciating the way they are stepping and walking and mincing and rolling the eyeball and shaking the body you know them and you see when they are like that they think like they are queen nigeria or queen ghana or queen kenya or queen their nation and they think everybody appreciates their beauty while everybody they, everybody is turning eyes the other direction because they see pride personified they see an embodiment of pride haughtiness and they see the high look and it, it makes people to be sick of them. They think everybody appreciates them. They think what a specimen of beauty I am. When actually everybody is thinking that they are stinking. And they are ugly. Because you know, no matter how beautiful you look like, normally and naturally, pride makes you ugly. You are young. But sometimes, pay attention. Look around you. You will see women, when you see them on the outside, and you look at them, and then before you talk to them, they will appear like one of the most beautiful women you have ever seen in your life. And then when you get near them, and they begin to talk to you, the woman will say, well, I need help, because my husband kicked me out. And then you think in your mind, how can a man kick out a beautiful woman like this? That's what I'm telling you. Pride makes women ugly. And no matter how beautiful somebody may think she looks at like, or she looks, if you are proud in your heart, then you're ugly in the sight of God. And so it says here, with wanton eyes, walking and missing as they go making a thing clean with their feet therefore the lord will smite with his scarf the crown of the head of the daughters of zion and the lord will discover their secret parts in that day the lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and the cross and the antlers like the moon the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers you see these people they just jewelry was everywhere attachments were everywhere the red and the green and the black and the yellow everything they just carried everything sometimes you see some women on the street the lord they are carrying then when they come for counseling they say i feel a heavy load something is weighing down on me and i say that's right that's right even without your talking without asking for counseling i can see the heavy load on you already you know and they carry this thing 
and they, bought, they borrow this one here, they borrow that one here, they pin this one there, they, they you know, do another thing there, and then they say, I don't know, my neck is aching because of a heavy load. There is a heavy load. And it is the devil that put that heavy load on them. And although we can pray for them, they too, they have to do something and detach their attachment. And when you detach what should not have been there, and then we know that you really mean business, you don't want the heaviness on you again, then you dissociate yourself from all this worldliness coming from the world. We pray with you, and the yoke is broken in Jesus' name. And then you see it says the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers and the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings and the rings and the most jewels and the changeable suits of apparel and the mantles and the wrinkles and the crisping pins and the glasses and the fine linen and the hoods and the bells. Many, many things they just, uh, you know, a single person will carry something in the hand, carry something in the in the wrist, and carry something on the neck, and carry the other one in the and put the holes in the in the ear. You know what they do now? One hole is no more enough in the ear. Now they put three holes in the ear and pin one here and hang this one here and suspend another one there and suspend another one in the neck and then you look at their legs. Even their toes now must have golden ring. Think about it. And you see, they think that it is beauty, but everything you will see, it is pride. And the fashion designers of today, they are appealing to the pleasure of the flesh, they are appealing to their lust, and they are appealing to their pride. But I pray God will touch your heart. I pray God will change your life. And all these things that the people of the world are following, they are following the pathway of Absalom. We will retrace ourselves. We will come back to the original place we should have been, and great will be the glory of God upon our lives in Jesus' name. In Proverbs chapter 31, verse 30. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 30. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. Beauty is vain. And a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Well, we have seen the case of Absalom. Pride, egotism, self-aggrandizement consumed him. No feeling for anyone else. No thought of anyone else. No pity for anyone else. No recognition for anyone else except himself. He was his own master. He was an idol to himself. And his own will was the only law he recognized. Let's now see his character. That brings us to point number two. The character of perverted Absalom. The character of perverted Absalom. In um, Second Samuel chapter 13, reading from verse 22. Second Samuel chapter 13 verse 22 and Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon neither good nor bad for Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar well Amnon was uh, the son one of the sons of David Tamar was also one of the daughters of David but Tamar was of the same mother with Amnon. And, Abs and uh, Amnon, sorry, Tamar was of the same mother with Absalom. And Tamar had been forced by Amnon to commit immorality. Absalom had about it. He hated the very idea. He didn't like what had happened. But he carried that animosity that grudge he carried that malice in the heart he never spoke to amnon not good not bad but he was pregnant with anger pregnant of evil and he carried that pregnancy of evil in the tummy in the mind in the heart for two full years now you know some people who tell us they're beautiful on the surface they appear beautiful but if you look at the hatred in their minds, you look at the animosity within, you look at the grudge they are bearing within, you look at the desire to revenge that they are carrying within, you see that they are pregnant with anger. 
anger, fury, love in them. You will be surprised that the people who are so beautiful facially, they are so ugly within. In verse 23, it came to pass out of two full years that Absalom had sheep shearers in their hazel, which is beside Ephraim. And Absalom invited all the king's sons. And Absalom came to the king and said, Behold now, thy servant has sheep shares, let the king, I beseech thee, and the servants go with thy servant. And the king said to Absalom, No, my nay, my son, let us not all now go, lest we be chargeable unto thee, so we don't become a great burden upon you to make you spend much. And he pressed him, how be it, he would not go, but he blessed him. And then Absalom then said, Absalom, if not, I pray thee, let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said unto him, Why should he go with thee? But Absalom pressed him that he let Amnon and all the king's son go with him. I want you to see the characteristics and the character of uh, Absalom here. When he wanted something, he got it. Nobody could say no. He went to the father. He had this evil plan in his heart. He wanted to kill. He had, plot. He had a, a plot against Amnon. And uh, he wanted to kill Amnon. But he didn't show it. Nobody will know the evil he carried in the heart. You see, if you are like that, that although you have a lot of privileges, you come from a good home, you come from a rich family, and you are now in a university, everything is available, you could become great in life. Yet, in your heart, there is buried wrath, fury, anger. And although people may not know, and you will, you will make your face normal, you will talk to the people normally, and yet the evil you are going to do is embedded, buried within your system. That was Absalom. And he went to the king and said, let the king come, and let all the king's sons come. And the king said, no. He pressed him. He said, no, and then blessed him. And said, you can go. He said, I cannot go yet. If you are not going to come, then let all the sons, let them come. And the king said, why are you demanding this? And he never gave the king the real reason. Can you think of a person like that? The father loved him very much. And the father would confide in him. And the father will tell him all his mind, but this young man, he will never say anything of his own plan. Maybe you are like that. The others will come, they will pour their hearts out to you. Pour their hearts out to you. And you will smile, you will talk with them, you will be in fellowship. They will think that you are a good friend. And you try to make yourself like an approachable person. But when you have a plan, nobody will know anything about it. Your closest friend. The leaders in the fellowship, the coordinators in the fellowship, they will not know anything at all. You bottle everything in. And eventually, Absalom pressed the father and he said, Okay, let the sons of the king, let them go with you. Verse 20. Now, Absalom had commanded his servant, saying, Mark ye now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine. And when I say to you, smite Amnon, then kill him, fear not. Have I not commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. Now, can you see a beautiful person, handsome person, privileged person, intelligent person, wise person, highly placed person? Can you see him here? Or everything was made for him. And yet this evil was bottled up in him. And then he instructed his servant. He said, at the time I tell you, strike him. Don't miss him. I am the one that commanded you. If that thing is wrong, let the guilt be on me. Smite that man. And that's exactly what they did. After they had done that, eventually he had to run away. And uh, when he became a fugitive, eventually he made an arrangement. And Joab began to plead for him. And Joab was telling the king, let the young man come back. And they made an arrangement that a woman that knew how to talk very well came to the king and told a parable, a story. 
And they made David to commit himself. After he had committed himself, then they said, But why is the king behaving like this to this young man? And he said, Is the hand of God not with you in this matter? And then the woman said, My lord, the king, nobody can hide anything from you. You are like an angel of the Lord. And then he called Joab. And then said, Joab, you want the young man back? And Joab said, Yes. He said, Okay, go and bring him. Look at it now. Chapter 14. In verse 23, so Joab arose and went to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, Let him turn to his own house. Let him not see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house and saw not the king's face. But the young man, since he had his own plan, he knew that if he was uh, banished somewhere, it's almost like house arrest. And uh, therefore he said, but why am I here and I'm not seeing the king? So he sent to Joab. He said, Joab, make arrangement for me. I must see the king. And Joab knew that even to be allowed to come back to the nation, that was enough privilege. So Joab did not answer. Look at it now what he did from verse uh, 28. So Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem and saw not the face of the king. Therefore Absalom sent to Joab and uh, to, have, uh, to have sent him to the king but he would not come to him and uh, when he sent again second time he would not come therefore he said to his, his servant see Job's field is near mine and he has barley, barley there go and set it on fire and Absalom's servant set the field on fire can you see that? Joab. Uh, this is Absalom. Here was the man, Joab, that made the arrangement to bring him back. He was a runaway fugitive. But the wickedness in his heart. I'm telling you that some people may look and some. If there is no grace of God in your heart, you'll be worse than the devil. You may look beautiful and you may be decorated from top to bottom if you are not born again if there is no grace of God in your life you will be terrible and uh, this job that has helped him that has put his own life into his own hand to be able to bring him back to the king he said go and burn his field verse, uh, verse 13 now therefore he said ok we we'll read that verse 31 and uh, then Job rose and came to Absalom unto his house and said unto him wherefore have thy servant set my field on fire? And Absalom said unto Joab, Behold, I sent unto thee, saying, Come hither, that I may send thee to the king, to say, Wherefore am I come from Geshur? It had been good for me to have been there still. Now therefore, let me see the king's face. And if there be any iniquity in me, let him kill me. <laughs> Can you say this man? A man that everybody in the nation knew he was guilty. He now said, if. And you know, if is a word of doubt. A word of uncertainty. Eh, I killed that man. Is that sinful? If there is any iniquity in me, let him kill me. So Joab came to the king. Joab could not even talk anymore about his field that had been burnt. About the harvest, he will not have that here. Because if you argue with Absalom, your life will be in jeopardy. So Job, although he was a warrior on himself, he knew that there is a level you don't go, there you don't go beyond that point, it was Absalom. So once Absalom said, this is what I want, he said, okay, I'll go to the king, I'm your obedient servant. Job came to the king and told him, and when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. You see that? This man could plot. He was a schemer. Now chapter 15 verse 1. And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared in chariots and horses 50 men to run before him. You see with all those things that had happened, you will see what he now did. You see the character of such a man. Look at verse 7. And it came to pass, chapter 15 verse 7. It came to pass after 40 years. That uh, Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. For thy servant vowed a vow when I abode at Geshur in Syria, saying, If the Lord shall bring me again indeed to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. Consecration. Pretended consecration. 
hypocritical kind of consecration, unreal consecration. The Lord said unto him, Go in peace. So he arose and he went to Hebron. And Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as ye hear the sound of the trumpet, then ye shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. And with Absalom went 200 men out of Jerusalem and were called. And they went in their simplicity and they knew not anything. They didn't know the mind of Absalom. They didn't know he wanted to destroy his father. They didn't know he wanted to drive away his father from the throne. They just followed him sheepishly and in their simplicity. Well, eventually, the conspiracy was so strong that uh, he now set an army, soldiers, to fight his father, kill his father, destroy his father, so that he will shed the blood of his own father and of people in Israel, and then he will now reign on Israel. What well, was the kind of man he was? And therefore, though his name, Absalom, means the father of peace, was there any peace in his life? The people that encountered him, confronted him, had anything to do with him. Did they have peace in their lives? That's why the Lord is telling us. Let these things sink into your ears. Consider what the scripture is saying. And the Lord will give you understanding. Our time is gone. Let's go to num number three. Tragic end of proud, of proud Absalom. Point two was the character of perverted Absalom. Point three now, the tragic end. Eventually the battle was set in array. He was able to get the chief counselor of David on his side, Ahithophel. He was able to get many other people too on his side. And now they set the battle and he himself went to the battle. And you know he did some foolish things. Terrible things, immoral things. He defiled the women that were in the father's house. Right in the open. And because Ahithophel had counseled him, do something terrible, do something bad, that your father will hate you. He will not want to have you. Then there will be a real battle, a real war. And he took to that kind of counsel, and now there was a battle. Can you think of a beautiful person? Handsome person, talented person, gifted person, a, a person, a charismatic person, a person that has gift and charisma and ability, everything you can think of, doing this. Yes, without grace, man will descend to the level of the lowest, vilest animal. We need grace in our lives. That's why as we have come here, we're talking about grace. We're talking about salvation. We're talking about transformation. We're talking about conversion. We're talking about a change of life. Because no matter what we have, no matter who we are, no matter everything may be going on for us, if we do not have the grace of God, you're the worst than the vilest of animals. Now we're going to look at the tragic end in uh, Second Samuel chapter 18. Second Samuel chapter 18, reading from verse 9. And Absalom met the servants of David. And Absalom rode upon a mule. And the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak. That is the, thick, the, the branches of a, a great oak. And his thick is a head caught hold of the oak. And he was taken up between heaven and earth. And the mule that was under him went away. He was riding. And remember here, the thick ear, bushy ear, that he caught only once in a year. And when he caught that thing, it was for national show exhibition. But at this time now, he had not caught it. And he was riding on the mule. And while the mule, the animal, was uh, going fast, it was in a forest. You know, it was a battle on the field. And uh, then the branches of that oak tree, the branches were sticking out. While it passed like that, the branch went into the thick air, and the air was so bushy that he kept that air suspended him on the branch. And then the animal went away. You think God will not catch the sinner? He has a thousand and one ways. The branches of the tree, the flies in society, the flies on the uh, on the tree. 
the bees, the animals, the air, the ocean, the fire, all the elements and his to use. If you are proud and you will not humble yourself, you know what he did to Pharaoh? That was the Red Sea. You know what he did to Nebuchadnezzar? He became an animal. The mind was changed. He went to the bush. You see what he did now to Absalom? He was hanging there. And a certain man saw it and told Joab, I said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. And Joab said unto the man that told him, And behold, thou sawest him. And why did thou not smite him there to the ground? And I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a girdle. And the man said unto Joab, Though I should receive a thousand shekels of silver in thy hand, yet would I not put forth mine hand against the king's son? For in our hearing the king charged thee, and Abishai, and Etai, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. David loved him. And even though this boy, this young man, drove David away from Jerusalem, from Zion, from the throne, David was still saying, take care of that young man. Don't touch that young man. That man is the specimen of beauty from the hand, from the hand of the God of heaven. Don't let a scratch come upon him. Can you see somebody that the father loved and he didn't have any love for that father? And, and you see sometimes there are people like that, you love them, you pray for them, you visit them, and you do everything, you do follow up on them, you give them money, you give them books, you help them, you do everything, the wickedness is still there in the heart. Even all the goodness that all the members of the fellowship can show to them will not make them to want to repent. That's Absalom. And then, uh, look at it now in verse uh, 14. Then said Joab, I will not tarry thus with me. And he took three darts in his hand, arrows in his hand, and thrust them through the heart of Absalom. And while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak, and ten young men that bear Joab's armor compassed him, and smote Absalom, and slew him. Verse 17, and they took Absalom, and cast him into a great pitch in the wood, and laid a great heap of stone of stones upon him, and all Israel fled everyone to his tent. You see this man, brilliant at the beginning. He died like an animal in the bush, and was buried like a dog in the pit. Why did his life end like that? Because pride will bring destruction. Well, we've learned about him. What's the lesson for us? The lesson for us is for us to understand that judgment day is coming. And it's appointed unto men who wants to die. And after this, the judgment. And because of the pride of his life, you see how he perished. But the Lord is calling upon us that everything is going well for us. And I pray everything will keep on going well for us. But he's telling us if we have not been saved, Maybe it's because of pride hindering you. Pride of education. Pride of your department. Pride of the special subject you're studying. Pride that you are one of the special privileged few to enter into higher institution. Or pride of beauty. Or pride of possession. Or pride of whatever it is. Remember, remember, the proud in heart is an abomination unto the Lord. And though hands join with hands, the sinner, the proud, those people will not go unpunished. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Salvation is available today. Do not allow pride to keep you back. You can see the life of this uh, young man, Absalom, and those of us as we are still young. Let us be humble in the sight of the Lord. He will exalt the humble. He will abase the proud. The choice is for you today. I pray and I believe you are going to make a good choice. You are not going to be like Absalom. And as the Lord has given you privileges in life, you will stay humble under the mighty hand of the Lord, and the Lord will exalt you in due season in Jesus' name. The Lord has brought us together to bless us. Do not allow the devil to have any crack in your life. Because I told you, 
that the devil, if you give him the chance, he can turn an ocean of pure water into bad poisoned water until there is not a drop of drinkable water remaining. Don't give him a chance. Resist the devil. Come to the Lord and say, Lord, if there be any pride in my heart, I come to surrender. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord. Humble yourself and come down. Come down from the ivory tower of pride. Pride brings destruction, brings judgment. That thing you call beauty can poison your life, can make you ugly. Don't allow your so-called beauty to make you rebellious, disobedient to the word of God, unyielding, unbending to the appeal of scripture and to the appeal of the spirit. Be submissive to your leadership on the campus. Our region coordinators, our state coordinators, our zonal coordinators, our leaders who are watching over us. Don't be too wise in your own eyes. I know it all in the beginning of destruction. I'm a man of a strong mind. Whatever I determine to do, that I will do. That will bring downfall, defeat into your life. 